I'll give you a, a, tell you a bit about myself. Um, I confirm I'm John Yeboah. I'm an osteopath. I originally come from Ghana. I trained as a biochemist and after working for two years I decided that wasn't for me. I wanted to work with people, work hands-on with people, so I retrained, studied osteopathy at the British School of Osteopathy here in London, and in 1992, 22 years ago, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in uh, osteopathy, which at the time was awarded by the Council for National Academic Awards, uh, CNAA UK. Now, I have been in full-time uh, osteopathic practice since then, uh, treating all sorts of muscle and joint and ligament problems. Now, in 2008, I studied uh, acupuncture or dry needling, uh, medical ac acupuncture is also known as, and um, I'm currently married with three children, um, two girls and a boy, a uh, girl aged 20, a uh, boy 18, and the youngest one is 15. Now in 1997 I set up the Enfield Osteopathic Clinic in Bushill Park, uh, and that was 17 years ago, and I have to say that um, I've been very fortunate on I've got over 4,000 patients on my database, uh, which is quite encouraging. What is osteopathy? It's a system of diagnosis and treatment where we diagnose faults within the body framework, be it muscles, ligaments, joints, um, tendons, bones, and so on. Now, that's based on the fact that structure governs function and function governs structure. And for the body to work properly, all the body parts, the ligaments, the muscles, the joints, the internal organs should work in unison, in synchrony, problems ensue if that particular setup doesn't work that way. Osteopathy involves a combination of osteopathic techniques and conventional medical uh, examination and diagnosis. What it means is, when you see an osteopath, the osteopath will take a case history and do a, a proper osteopathic exam examination listen to your heart, look into your eyes, do, uh, examine your joints, examine your nerves, and so on. Now, based on the diagnosis, the osteopath will then use manipulative techniques to try and um, resolve the problem. Now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how osteopathy started. Osteopathy was started in, in the US in 1874 by uh, the gentleman over there called Andrew Taylor Steele. A little bit of history. In 1917, the first school of osteopathy was established in, in London. And um, the first race of osteopaths, that's the General Council and Race of Osteopaths, uh, was set up in 1936. I qualified in 1992, and the Osteopaths Act, uh, which uh, meant that osteopathy wasn't fringe anymore, became law, uh, was um, in 1993. In 1997, the first race, statutory race of osteopaths uh, was formed, and it opened in 1998. Uh, currently, there, there, there are um, sort of campaigning and moves to get osteopathy on the, on the NHS. Now, I, I, I'd like to share that with you because this is what Andrew Taylor still called the first lesson uh, in osteopathy. Now, he, he found that whenever he had a headache, he would go and rest the back of his head on his mother's clothesline, and after a few minutes, the headache went. Oh. And that's what we do. 
as osteopaths. Basically using our hands, using forces, and I'm talking about structural osteopathy. There are uh, other branches of osteopathy, which I will mention later on. <laughs> one side and some of them depending on the design has a second hump here usually one is higher than the other and this is the normal foam but you can have memory foam and the difference is that that one bounces back but the memory foam stays depressed let's see if that's now that's also normal um, whatever you do Posture-wise, you should always think about keeping the spine in a neutral position. This is the most energy-efficient position for the body. The moment you go that way, you no know, troubles. The moment you go that way, trouble. Then that way, trouble. So you want to maintain that all the time both in that direction and in that direction. Now, when you're sleeping, you think about the same thing. So, if you're on your back, you want that to rest there like that. So, you want... You want that bit here to support the head and that bit to support the neck. So then, you keep that normal S shaped posture. If you sleep on it wrongly, which people do when they purchase these pillows, they sleep on it like that, you can see that the neck's not supported. Um, shall I bring it around a bit more? So, so that's the pillow. This is the correct way of lying on it on your back. Head is supported, okay, <coughs> neck is supported as well, and it keeps that shape. If your mattress is sags, that will make that go that way, so you lose that lumbar curvature there, that's not good. When you sleep on your side, you want the spine to stay straight still, so you sleep that way. Remember your shoulders come here, uh, the right shoulder will be here. So that will still support the neck, and then that bit will support the head. Now, whatever you do, if your bed sucks in and you go like that, you'll have problems. If the pillows are too, if you use too many pillows, then again, you're like that. That's not good. So to look at it this way, uh, on your back, too, too many pillows. See, you've got that wrong curvature. Normal pillow, fine. That has to be the other way around. So the neck is supported and the head is supported. Now, on your side, looking at it from the back, you're sagging. The spine's curved. That's not good. So what you want to do is take one away have it in the right position, that supports the neck, that supports the head. The spine will sit straight in that direction, and that's what you need. Very often people ask me, what's the best mattress? Now, a good point to start is to go to their sleepcouncil.org. They have good advice, good updated advice on the right mattress. And it's a good point to start. And a good mattress is one where when you lie on your side and someone looks at you from, from the back, 
the, sp the spine still stays straight without you feeling pressure on the hip or the shoulder. So if you feel comfortable under the hip here and under the shoulder here and the spine is still straight, then it's a good mattress. So the mattress shouldn't be too soft and it shouldn't be too hard. Too soft and the spine sucks in too hard and you feel pressure on the hips and shoulder. So it has to be a balance between the two. How often should you change your mattress? I would reckon an, an average mattress should last 8 to 10 years. Right. A good bed, the height, should mm -hmm. be one where you can get in and out easily without struggling. Well, up to your palms? Yes. Um, Above the knee? That would be too high. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, just about the about knee would be, so you can come in and out of, of it without struggling. But that also reminds me about settees and, um, and sofa. Yeah, yeah um, it's, it's a short story, but I'll be very quick with that. We, we intended to change our settee, and there was a nice one, and everyone went there and sat on it. I went and sat on it. And I was so concerned, I actually called the, the salesman to say, you shouldn't be selling this. And then, well, he said to me, well, you know, we sell what people want. <laughs> so I called the manager and said, you shouldn't be selling these things because they'll um, give people back trouble. He said, what are you? I said, I'm an osteopath and I treat so many people uh, because they've uh, used this kind of um, furniture. And then when I turned to go, he said, but anyway, we're making you busy, aren't we? <laughs> 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 I thought, no, we're talking about prevention. <laughs> um, so, and, 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 and the reason I felt that was bad is you actually, when you sit on it, you sink, you sink in yes. and your spine goes from that yeah. to really yeah. severe that. And you think you're relaxed, but actually you're creating so many problems. Um, so again, with that particular settee, you have to actually push yourself and struggle to come out. And even getting in, you have to really support mm. yourself. But it looked good, people felt because they're slouching, they were relaxed, but no. So again, uh, it's about the same thing. It shouldn't be too low. You should be able to get in and out. If you struggle to get on it mm -hmm. and off it, it's not good for you. So then go by that, you know. Just sit and then come up. So eventually, I'll come back to, yeah. to you. Eventually, the one you bought, you, you can actually get on it and come off it without touching the armrest. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Firm. Yeah, it's firm, mm -hmm. you don't slouch into it, and also the distance between the, uh, the, the, the front end and the back rest shouldn't be too much, because yes. otherwise you're still slouch anyway, because mm -hmm. yeah. your back yeah. doesn't get yeah. Yeah. So then you have to use cushions mm -hmm. to bring it forward, yeah. so you have to think about that as well. Mm -hmm. It's a bit tricky, yeah. isn't it? On your stomach, if you don't use a pillow, it's a bit better, but I still won't advise that. Um, on the pillow, on your stomach, you can see that you can't let your chin lie on that, so your head should be rotated that way or that way. Either way, it doesn't help the spine stay in that neutral position. So I wouldn't advise sleeping on your stomach. Mm -hmm. The head will have to be that way or that way. And if you're like in that position for 40 minutes or more, it's likely to overstrain the ligaments, the ligaments that support the vertebrae. Because when you sleep, your muscles relax. When you're upright and, and, and not asleep, the muscles tense up to protect you and hold your head upright. But when you sleep, mm -hmm. the, the, the head drops like that, because the muscles let go and the strain goes on the ligaments, and the ligaments get inflamed. It's a bit like when people go out, you know, Saturday night, come back, they want to watch the telly 
for a few minutes and go to sleep and they fall asleep mm -hmm. on, yeah, on the sofa, they wake up and it's like, ooh, Monday morning we get calls like that. <laughs> <laughs> Always Monday morning. Um, yeah, so you want to watch that. So I wouldn't advise, you know, on, on your stomach. But on your side, apparently when you sleep, it's a bit like the uh, recovery position. When you sleep and you're relaxed, your muscles relax, your tongue relaxes. If you're on your back, most people snore when they sleep on their backs. That your tongue falls backwards. So then you snore more. But when you're on your side, if, when the tongue goes floppy, relaxed, it falls to the side and that actually clears your airway. So I would recommend sleeping on your side. That's provided you don't have a shoulder problem, provided your mattress will take you. <laughs> This particular technique is very useful for where the lower back joints, so that, that's her line like that, and what it is, when the back muscles go tight for a long time, it causes the joints, what we call the facet joints, to lock because the muscles clench and seize up and when there's not much movement for a few days, they get stuck. Now, you can stretch, sometimes you can release them. This particular technique helps to unlock those joints. So if I, if I do that, you can see the joint actually opening out. And, and it's rather like when, when you do that. One click. That's, that's it, and it clicks. It's the separation of the joints that causes the clicking sound. So if you keep the bottom leg straight, and then that bent, that foot right behind there, and this hand on your hip, and if I pull this arm forward, that's it. Now you can hold on to your elbow. Now if I reach around, now what I'm doing is I'm moving her pelvis towards me, and I'm, I'm feeling what's happening in the spine because I'm twisting the lower part of the spine but I'm stopping the top part from moving. So if I want to not click this part but focus the force right here where it's needed, I just hold back the upper ones. In fact, twisting hair locks the upper ones anyway. And then it's forward, forward, shoulder drops back a bit. Yeah, that's it. Now listen to that. And about three joints, three L4, five, L5, S1, and um, L4, S3 joints clicked, three that. Go on the other side, so balance. And head this way. Um, and you're on the left. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah, so then do the other side. And that straight back bends, and a twist. Did it hurt? No, not at Good. Now hold on to the elbow. So I come through here, and the idea of doing that is really to stop, because if I do that, she'll roll forward. And also, it's not very specific, and, and so you know, I could end up clicking here when I really want to click here. And here we go. Shoulder drops back, you okay? Yeah, I okay. It's uncomfortable. Yeah, okay. You okay? Better now? Twist around a bit more. And then, if I roll you forward, here we go. So this thumb can hold on to the top ones, and that can guide which one I want to click. So, now the thing is, I'm not getting a locking here. Uh, it's sort of the end feel is yeah, yeah. So it, it won't click. It's bouncing back. There are two reasons for that. One could be because the muscles are holding tight, or partly because they're not relaxed. So I don't force it, I leave it, and try again another time. The other reason could be that the joint itself is not stuck. It's just the muscles holding it. Now the difference is, if the joint is stuck, the end feel is more solid. And if it's soft end feel, it's muscular. 
muscle restriction. How's that? Yeah. yeah.